All right, good afternoon. Thank you to another HRAI Insider webinar. Today, we are pleased to welcome back Phil Boudreaux Bitzer, who's going to be joining us for part three of his CO2 refrigeration series. This one's going to be a bit of a deeper dive into transcritical CO2 compressors and cycles. He's going to get into it. Uh, we're going to have lots of time for questions at the end. And if you have those questions, please place them in our Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, or you can put them in the chat function as well. I'll be taking a look at those, and uh, when we're finished the presentation, we will get into them. So at this point, I am going to re-welcome back Phil. Here's that familiar face. How you doing, Matt? I'm fantastic. Good to see you again, Phil. Yeah, good to see you as well. I'm going to drop off and let you do your thing. Very good. Well, thanks again for the opportunity and uh, welcome everyone uh, to today's part three of transcrit uh, transcritical refrigeration is actually part three of a three part series. The first part was the uh, uh, were, were more of the basics of the CO2 properties and some safety and uh, we got into compressors um, and then we also covered subcritical compressors in subcritical systems, um, I believe in part two. So this part three is, is dedicated to the transcritical circuit and its control. And uh, here are the topics for today, uh, CO2 challenges and solutions, the gas cooler itself, um, the uh, optimum high side pressure and how is that calculated? How is that controlled uh, on the fly um, in a system where, where conditions are changing? Transcritical system layouts, as I mentioned, and at the end of this, uh, well, parallel compression will, will be one of the uh, topics that I cover briefly, but that's actually, you know, that is a form of transcritical system. And then I'll give you a, a brief introduction to uh, ejectors and, and show you uh, a few different ways in which ejectors are used in CO2 transcritical systems. So Professor Gustav Lorenzen uh, at the Professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Tech proposed that we could use uh, refrigerants or CO2 refrigerant in its supercritical state. So here's a guy who said, well, why are we so focused on subcritical uh, refrigeration? We have this, you know, this very good refrigerant and, and one of its main drawbacks aside from uh, the fact that it operates at high pressures is, is that you would have to operate it in the supercritical state. So let's, let's work towards uh, uh, perhaps producing systems for uh, that can operate supercritically or transcritically as they call it. And transcritical again is just, it's a very simple term. It just means that the compressors or compressor in the system is transcending the critical point. And again, the, the critical point for CO2 is approximately 88 degrees Fahrenheit. So when the compressors um, have to develop pressures that, that exceed that critical point, we call it transcritical. And when we're above that critical point, um, the actual state of the refrigerant itself is supercritical. So Professor Gustav Lorenzen developed a transcritical cycle during 1988 uh, to 1991, and, and you can see what it looks like here, but we'll discuss that in a few moments. So CO2 was used uh, quite a bit, in fact, in the 1800s and up to 1950, and, and kind of disappeared back then uh, when CFCs uh, and some of the HFCs took over. And, uh, you know, with, with the regulations, ODP um, uh, reductions or elimination uh, of refrigerants that, that have uh, any ODP, and, uh, and now refrigerants that have a relatively high global warming potential, uh, CO2 has uh, really made a comeback. Um, in addition to other refrigerants, such as ammonia and, and other naturals, even such as hydrocarbons, uh, like propane, um, have made a comeback uh, also. In order to fully exploit CO2, um, existing and new technologies are applied in order to address the high press pressure challenge. Um, in order to do this, we needed to come up with transcritical compressors, which is basically a, a high pressure reciprocating compressor. Uh, another technology, uh, which is not new technology, uh, but fits well with the CO2 in the CO2 uh, transcritical world, is the receiver with flash gas bypass, which we'll talk about. And how do we address the absence of a relationship between temperature and pressure uh, of the supercritical fluid, which is above the critical point? So this led to algorithm, I call them algorithm-driven regulators. They're called high pressure valves. Um, some have called them magic valves in the industry. 
And also, how can we improve the efficiency and reliability of transcritical refrigeration processes? Because right from the get-go, uh, CO2 transcritical is not really considered efficient. So the more we can we can apply other technologies to make it more efficient, the better. And in areas where where you're you're running most of the time subcritical, it's just a matter of running the trans transcritical mode for you know several hours during the year, um, but a very small percentage of the of the total number of hours in the year. So with these technologies here, it, it uh, enables us to reduce um, the energy input to the system. So some of the other things applied. Uh, heat reclaim, obviously not new. Parallel compression, ejectors, which I mentioned before. Adapted control algorithms. So making these control algorithms as best that they can be. And they're, and they're constantly being improved. Uh, internal heat exchangers is another one. So uh, I'm not sure if we had this slide uh, in one of the uh, previous presentations, but if you look at the bits or operating instructions, you'll see that there's a number of, of um, temperature limits and things like that. So achieving the minimum operating temperatures can be more challenging than keeping temperatures below the maximum limits. And the case in point here would be superheat, superheat. Uh, that's always a big one. Um, you'll note that the minimum uh, superheat entering a, a CO2 uh, compressor should be 20 Kelvin or 36 degree Rankin, you know, un unless you can ensure that the discharge superheat and crankcase temperatures are going to be uh, at least at the minimum, but preferably above the minimum. So this is where internal heat exchangers come in very useful. Uh, here's a look at a, um, a heat exchanger. And we saw this in the subcritical session where we take liquid out of the receiver and it has a fair amount of enthalpy in it. And this heat, some of this heat is actually transferred into the suction line of the low temperature compressors. Uh, in order to increase superheat. So this is one way in which a heat exchanger is used. Another one is to take the heat from the gas cooler outlet and transfer that to the, um, the vapor that's leaving the flash gas. And actually, saturated vapor, when it leaves a receiver, uh, it's very normal for it to, um, as, as we reduce the pressure, the, uh, some droplets of CO2 will form. And you may recall that the latent heat of CO2 is quite high, and also the amount of pressure drop it takes to reduce the saturation temperature by one degree is, is considerably more than what we're used to with HFC refrigerants. And those are the two things. If we have heat and we have pressure drop, they're going to help uh, flash off, uh, boil off uh, liquid droplets. In the case of CO2, without heat exchange, um, it, it's highly likely that liquid droplets leaving an evaporator are going to show up at the suction of the compressor. And this is why superheat in evaporators uh, is, is very important, but not just superheat, but absolutely stable, stable superheat. So what we're doing is superheating this refrigerant um, before it enters the medium temp compressors of a booster system. And one other way in which to apply it is if it's a parallel system, then the flash gas goes through a heat exchanger before it enters the parallel compressor. So let's move on to transcritical CO2 refrigeration and uh, let's talk about what it really is. First of all, we want to note that in the low side of a transcritical, so here's your transcritical cycle. This is a basic single stage transcritical cycle. Um, the evaporator is in the two phase region. And because it's within the two phase region, the, we can see the evaporation process is subcritical. So whether it's a subcritical system or a transcritical system, the evaporator is always operating subcritically, even the medium temp. What makes the transcritical system different is, of course, we transcend the critical point right here. So this is the, the transcritical uh, or the critical pressure would be here. And we transcend that into the supercritical fluid region. And heat rejection here is a little bit different than what we're used to with HFC systems and ammonia. And we'll talk about that in a, in a couple of minutes. During transcritical mode, the gas cooler cools the supercritical fluid. So it's actually called a gas cooler because we're not condensing. Um, unlike a, a condenser where you've got superheated refrigerant, goes into the condenser, we first desuperheat it, and then we condense it back to a liquid. And then we further subcool it to make sure that 
we actually have liquid showing up at the expansion valves and not uh, liquid with uh, with flash gas uh, entrained. During low ambient temperatures, the gas cooler becomes a condenser. So if you look at these gas coolers here, they look a lot like condensers. They're basically heat exchangers. Uh, in this case, they're air cooled. So they reject heat to the outdoors. Um, and we pass the supercritical fluid through the tubes and fins. And in some cases, there will be uh, spray headers with nozzles um, to make it an adiabatic type gas cooler. Um, and with the adiabatic, um, the drier, the ambient, uh, the weather is, <clears throat> if we've got a, a, a lot of um, a pretty high wet bulb depression, <clears throat> so a big difference between the wet bulb temperature and the dry bulb temperature, then we can get a lot of additional cooling um, with, uh, with the adiabatic type or evaporative gas cooler. So here's a, a fundamental point um, to know about with when working with uh, transcritical systems. For every um, gas cooler outlet temperature, which the gas cooler outlet temperature is going to be dependent on what the ambient temperature is going to be. But for every gas cooler outlet temperature, there's going to be a maximum um, or your coefficient, uh, uh, coefficient of performance is going to be a function of, um, of, of that, basically. And I'll explain that more because it says here a function of high side pressure. Well, the high side pressure is actually more of a function of the gas cooler outlet temp, but like I said, we'll talk about it. But the point to know here is that um, the, the controls on the high side of the system are always trying to optimize for the highest coefficient of performance. And the highest coefficient of performance isn't always a lower pressure or a higher pressure. It, it depends. And I will explain that further as well. So the coefficient of performance, again, is the net refrigeration effect divided by the heat of compression here. Here we have two cycles, okay? Um, not really listing the conditions here, but just to illustrate a point. The compression process is fairly similar, although the red cycle here, um, it has to compress uh, or lift the pressure even higher. But note that when it lifts the pressure even higher, and then we cool, the gas cooler uh, outlet, uh, or cool the CO2 rather, at the gas cooler outlet, down to a, a lower temperature, then we have more enthalpy that we can absorb in the evaporator. So the key point to remember here is that your CO2 um, isotherms, okay, so these are constant temperature lines, which we call isotherms. Um, above the critical point, they're somewhat horizontal, and then they become very vertical, um, as we move over to the left, and your your optimum pressure is generally going to be on that part of that steep slope there. Okay, so uh, we wouldn't want to just arbitrarily set the pressure to a certain value. It's going to depend on where we can get the most refrigeration effect. Okay, for a certain power or power uh, input power to the compressor. And it tends to be a changing number. Uh, it will be, in fact, with, uh, with ambient temperatures outside, then your optimum pressure will vary. And note that the optimum pressure is not the point where you uh, necessarily get optimum capacity. Uh, in fact, it shows here, you can actually sacrifice lower coefficient of performance for higher capacity. And this could be done you know, to facilitate uh, heat reclaiming cycle, for example or if a compressor is down and uh, the system needs to be forced to get more capacity out of it, even at the expense of um, reduced efficiency. Looking at an example here, if we have a gas cooler outlet temperature of 95 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 degrees C and an evaporating temperature of minus 10 C or 14 degrees Fahrenheit, um, we can um, take a look at the difference uh, pressure makes uh, in terms of the, uh, the coefficient of performance. There's different ways of determining what this optimum pressure is. One is the iteration method. And I mean, the, the most basic way to do this is, is to take a pressure enthalpy diagram or a few of them and plot a number of cycles and find out where your best uh, uh, coefficient of performance is. There are also algorithms that are used. Um, this one here, calculation A, uses an evaporating temperature and a gas cooler outlet temperature. Okay, to determine uh, what your uh, 
optimum pressure is. There's another calculation here, um, which is somewhat more simplified. There's a an, uh, there's a, a metric version and an IP version, which you can use to determine what the gas cooler outlet, uh, or sorry, what the high side pressure is. And if you look at the difference between the two, uh, 12, approximately 1250 versus uh, 1300, your difference in coefficient of performance at that point is like 0.01. In case you're thinking, well, 50 pounds or so is 45, 50 PSI is, is quite a bit. It's, it's really not. So using the iterative method will look something like this. We start out with a, a cycle where we have um, set the high side pressure to 1,150 PSI. In this case, we get 7.58 tons. The power input to the compressors is, uh, well, it's just one compressor in this case, a, a Bitzer 4 FTE-20K. And the coefficient of performance here is 4.06. That is indicated by the blue or the cycle highlighted by with blue here. And the next one here we'll look at is the light orange cycle, which is 1200 PSIA. So if we increase the pressure to 1200 PSIA, then our net refrigeration effect increases. But remember uh, that we're following the same constant, uh, this isotherm that, that corresponds to 95 degrees as this is the value uh, that we're working with. So this is probably going to be like a 88, 90 degree ambient temperature or something like that. So your gas cooler outlet would be 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So you can see that these conditions, their gas cooler outlets are all on the 95 degree isotherm. So by increasing the pressure, we're actually increasing the net refrigeration effect, but to a point, because then the isotherm becomes quite vertical um, as we move more to the left in the pH diagram. So at 1200 PSIA, you can see our power input, of course, to the compressor is going to increase. And our coefficient of performance, though, is also increased to 5.89. Now, if we increase to 1250 PSIA, now we um, now our, our capacity, uh, it, it, it goes up a little bit more. So we're at 12.28 tons, 24 kilowatts of, of consumption and the coefficient of performance has gone up even further to 6.14. Increasing to 1300 PSIA, you can see that um, our net refrigeration effect went up a little bit compared to the additional heat of compression that we needed to get there. Um, as a result, our capacity, it still went up 12.64 tons, power inputs 24.8 kilowatts, but the coefficient of performance is starting to go the other way. This would indicate that, that our optimum pressure here would be something like 1,250 PSIA. So I just wanted to show you this to give you an idea what the algorithms are, are working to achieve on the fly uh, with the changing ambient temperature. In the high side of a transcritical system, of course, the refrigerant is in a supercritical state. And when we reject heat in a supercritical state, we're rejecting heat sensibly, which means it starts at a higher temperature and ends at a lower temperature. So it'll be ambient temperature plus a few degrees, perhaps five degrees or so. And if it's a 95 or a 90 degree ambient, we may have a 95 degree gas cooler outlet temperature. But the process in which takes place in that gas cooler is a sensible cooling process from 210 degrees Fahrenheit here, okay, to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So this makes CO2 very good in heat exchangers that are used for heat reclaim, heating water, heating uh, air, and things like that. Um, there's some things that, that need to be considered. Uh, for example, uh, a pinch point. There is a what they call a pinch point where your heat exchange goes down to a, a a minimum because the temperature difference is, is very low. It's just a characteristic of, of CO2 when you're rejecting heat into uh, another uh, medium like uh, air or water. So here's the, the Gustav Runsen cycle again. Uh, with this particular system, we have this is a single stage cycle. So we have a compressor discharges into a gas cooler um, into a, um, a high pressure regulation valve. This is just a throttling valve. Um, which will work to achieve the pressures that are required in this system. We have an evaporator here, which is not controlled by superheat. Um, 
therefore the uh, the receiver in this system is used on the low side and the liquid level will vary accordingly. Uh, so oil level or sorry, oil return can become challenging because your oil is in the in the liquid for the most part and it needs to be brought back up to the uh, uh, return to the compressor somehow without bringing the liquid back. So the heat exchanger becomes very important to superheat the saturated vapor here, but also to help uh, boil off CO2 uh, liquid um, with the oil that's entrained as it returns to the compressor. So note that I mentioned this is a single stage cycle, single stage compression, single stage expansion. Here's a modified uh, type of single stage cycle here. Um, where we've introduced a receiver, but put it on the high side. Okay, so here's your receiver. And then we have an expansion valve here, which is going to be throttling to hold uh, or maintain a specific superheated evaporator outlet um, to get good control of the evaporator, but also to make sure we're superheating refrigerant to return to the compressor. And note that the superheat that leaves the evaporator is, is, is generally not going to be high enough for the uh, inlet to the compressor. This is where we run into problems with lubrication in the compressor, where the CO2 dilutes the oil to the point where the viscosity is too low uh, to, to have any lubrication value for the compressor. So there's a high pressure regulation valve and it's after the gas cooler. And the, the high pressure regulation valve uh, would be controlled uh, based on the, uh, one common way to do it is to look at the leaving temperature of the gas cooler and adjust the pressure to get the maximum coefficient of performance. And supercritical fluid goes into the valve and what leaves the valve is actually flash gas and liquid. So that perhaps this is um, one of the reasons why it's called a magic valve. It's, it's got refrigerant CO2 going in in one state and leaving the other side in two different states. So the flash gas, of course, uh, will remain at the top of the vessel, liquid drops to the bottom, and that's fed out to your various evaporators. Uh, and this really is the preferred type of, of method when using multiple evaporators. So I'll, I'll cover this uh, operation on a high pressure valve even further. Now, in this case, what we've done is introduced a, a second stage of expansion. So we've got single stage compression. We have the first stage of expansion is the high pressure valve here. And then the second stage of expansion is the expansion valve itself. So here's a, a look at, this is a, an earlier system that Dan Foss put out. We have a gas cooler here. Um, this is our compressor, of course. And we have a controller that's controlling the gas cooler. Uh, specifically, it's looking at the outlet temperature, and it's also looking at ambient temperature. Uh, it's doing a lot of other things as well, such as controlling the cycling of compressors, the speed of compressors, uh, things like that. But what I want to focus on here is what's going on in the high side. So the ambient temperature could be 90 degrees and the controller is going to be cycling the fans, uh, bringing the fans on to a point to bring that gas cooler outlet temperature down to a, a point that's just a few degrees above the ambient. Then over here, we have a high pressure valve controller. So this was the ICM TS valve. Um, that will, it's basically just a stepper motor type valve. And the algorithm is um, in, the, in the controller. And the controller also has a temperature input from the gas cooler outlet. And it also has a, a pressure transducer. So as the temperature changes, the controller will adjust. It will adjust the um, position of this valve to achieve the optimum pressure. So if it needs to increase the pressure, it will start to throttle more towards a closed position. And the entire time that it's modulating, in fact, the entire time that it's operating, it's, it's going to be um, reading the pressure. So this is where it gets its feedback. So it, it will know when it, when it reaches that, that optimum pressure. At the same time, we're forming a lot of flash gas here when we're operating in transcritical mode. And that flash gas, we don't really wanna be sending that to the evaporators. So in this case, there's also a pressure transducer that's connected to the receiver on the vapor side. And there's going to be a predetermined set point pressure that the manufacturer of the, of the system, for example, 
will will set the, this for us. So this could be a five to six hundred psi uh, receiver, for example. And as the pr- as the pressure uh, begins to exceed that level, what will happen is this controller will control this valve over here, which is uh, oftentimes referred to as a flash gas bypass valve. So what it's doing is taking vapor off of the receiver and transferring that directly into the um, high temp uh, compressor or the medium temp compressor as they're often called. So here's a, a look at a transcritical booster system. So this is the perhaps the most basic of the booster system. Uh, an earlier generation where we have our low temperature evaporators, um, the uh, compressors on the low temp side are subcritical and their discharge is basically piped into the suction of the medium temp compressors. So we have, depending on the number of stages of low temp, you know, some heat that's being sent to the suction of the compressors themselves on the medium temp side. At the same time, we have a medium temp group. So we have medium temp loads in addition to the low temp loads. These are returning um, vapor with you know, a certain amount of superheat. So you've got your superheat perhaps could be eight, 10 degrees or something in the evaporator. Plus you've got suction line heat um, and perhaps and pressure drop, which will have some impact on it. But like I said before, pressure drop has less impact on saturation temperature um, compared with uh, HFCs and ammonia. So again, on the medium temp side, we discharge into an oil separator. And uh, in this case, they're showing a low pressure oil management system. So the oil um, drops out of suspension here. Uh, When there's enough oil that accumulates here, there would be an optical switch that opens and allows the oil to enter a low pressure reservoir. And then from the low pressure reservoir, feeds the oil level regulators to the various compressors in in the system. After the oil separator, the refrigerant uh, uh, may may, uh, go through a heat reclaim heat exchanger, but then it's off to the gas cooler uh, for cooling. Uh, And again, in transcritical mode, we would be sensibly cooling the CO2. And in this case, then uh, the temperature would be reduced to ambient temperature plus a few degrees. Then there's the high pressure control valve, which I said before um, is controlled being mainly on the uh, the gas cooler exit temperature. Okay, so the pressure of this that this this high pressure control valve is trying to um, is trying to maintain optimum pressure. Again, the optimum pressure is what's going to get us the optimum coefficient of performance. So supercritical fluid into the valve, liquid and flash gas leaving the valve. Liquid leaves the bottom of the receiver and is available to our medium temp evaporators and to the low temperature evaporators. And then the flash gas bypass valve will be uh, opened to some extent as the pressure exceeds the set point pressure uh, for the receiver. And then that will mix with the medium temp flow. So from the medium temp evaporators and from the low temperature compressors, the discharge from the low temperature compressors. So there's gotta be a pretty good balance between the medium temp and the low temp compressors, the flash gas bypass. This is where heat exchangers and and more automatic control becomes important with CO2 systems because things do change. Sometimes you may have a a shift in uh, load between low temp and medium temp. And um, when that shifts, the system should be able to um, adjust accordingly. So this is what that booster system looks like again. So we have our low temperature compressors basically discharging into the medium temp compressors. And here's our medium temp cycle operating uh, in transcritical mode. Here's our gas cooler valve or high pressure valve not gas cooler valve, sometimes it's gas cooler outlet valve, but it's normally called a high pressure valve, magic valve, something like that. Here is the vapor. This is the top of the receiver. This is the bottom of the receiver. And then we can see um, heat exchangers in here. Um, you'll, you'll see on the low temp circuit anyways, we have a, a liquid to suction heat exchanger to further increase the superheat into the subcritical compressor. So you can see that here as well. And there's the cycle. And as I mentioned before, it's very normal for the receiver um, when we're uh, when we're passing the, the vapor from the receiver 
to the medium time suction. Very normal for a small amount of liquid to, to appear. And, and we can see the proof of that right here on this pH diagram. We've, uh, we're just to the left of the saturated vapor curve, which indicates that there's a small amount of liquid. In. So that was a two-stage process. Um, another possibility is to have a three-stage process where we have our first stage would be your high pressure valve. And the second stage would be um, an intermediate valve, I guess you could say, after the liquid leaves the main receiver, um, some of that liquid will be fed to the medium temperature evaporator. Some of the liquid will be fed to a secondary receiver, or we call that a low temp receiver. So its pressure is further reduced, which forms more flash gas. And that flash gas is bypassed um, back to the medium temp compressors. So the actual quality of the refrigerant um, is better, meaning there'll be less flash gas entering these evaporators uh, in the low stage. And again, here's that uh, heat exchanger that we saw before. So first stage, high pressure valve. Second stage is your um, uh, pressure reduction valve, pressure regulator between the receivers. And then your third stage would be the uh, expansion valves in the low temp. So the three stage expansion is really from the perspective of the low temp side, the medium temp remains the two stage expansion process. Okay, so you can see it here, low stage compression, medium temp compression, and then we have gas cooler valve. Here's our medium temperature um, expansion valves. Okay, so this is the liquid leaving the flash tank here at 0.8 and um, entering the medium temp, uh, medium temp side. And then we have uh, a further reduction of the refrigerant uh, pressure at the uh, low temperature evaporators here. So this is where the secondary receiver comes in. This is the secondary pressure drop. Parallel compression. Uh, so this is a, another technology uh, that was added a number of years ago as a means to increase the efficiency of the transcritical cycle. It's called a parallel compressor because it operates in parallel with the medium temp compressors. Now it's important to note here that the receiver pressure is always gonna be held at a pressure that's higher than the medium temp suction. This has to be the case, or we wouldn't have any pressure drop across these valves here on the medium temp side, and the expansion valves wouldn't be able to feed without pressure drop. So the receiver has to be held at a higher pressure. But we have a loss that occurs when we take the flash gas bypass and, and pass that directly into the medium temp suction. There is an opportunity to separately compress that refrigerant from the receivers, and that's exactly what parallel compressors do, is they... Um, uh, they take the vapor from the receiver and compress it. So these operate at a higher suction pressure than the medium temperature compressors and uh, also takes the load off the medium temp compressor. So ultimately, at the end of the day, the overall system efficiency in the, in the case compared to a regular flash gas bypass system, uh, this flash gas bypass system with parallel compression would achieve higher efficiencies. And this is what it looks like. So you can see your medium temp compressors are here, and then we have the parallel compressors here. And what this pH diagram doesn't show is the flash gas bypass uh, that should still exist here. Because what will happen, uh, and this is one of the challenges with systems with uh, parallel compression, is once you stage down your parallel compressors to the minimum compressor, or to the minimum uh, minimum step, let's call it one one compressor that's operating uh, perhaps on a variable speed drive, and now it's at minimum speed. And then your flash gas load continues to reduce because the ambient temperature is dropping. At some point in time, we're going to have to shut the parallel compressors off and then revert back to flash gas bypass. So really, that should show here as well. Okay, and I, I have a few slides uh, to show you, to introduce you to ejector technology, as promised. So ejectors, first and foremost, um, ejectors themselves are not a new technology, uh, but they're finding more and more uh, application in the, in the CO2 world, particularly uh, transcritical, but it doesn't, well, I guess it doesn't have to be that way, but that's typically how they're 
uh, they're used. Um, all the ones I've seen so far are are used um, in conjunction with the uh, with the flow leaving the gas cooler. Um, it uses the expansion work to induce side flow. So generally, this would be in parallel with a high pressure valve um, in the high side of the system. And what the ejector enables us to do is reduce the um, pressure from the gas cooler side down to the receiver pressure, but do it in a slightly more efficient way than just throttling it through a high pressure valve. That through it, when, whenever you go through an expansion valve or a high pressure valve, uh, such as the one used on the outlet of a gas cooler, um, there is a bit of a loss there because that expansion process takes place at constant enthalpy. And with an ejector process, it follows more of a constant entropy cycle. And uh, I'll show you more uh, with that in a moment. So it uses expansion work to induce a side flow. So that means the side flow is basically a third port on the ejector. So you've got an inlet and an outlet, and then we have a side port. It does not require any power, as you can see. Well, that's not quite true. In the case of a proportional uh, ejector like this, um, we have uh, something just to modulate the position of the ejector. But it, it, what this really is, is meaning, uh, this final point here, is that there is no compressor. Uh, you don't have to um, use power to increase the pressure of the refrigerant. So all we're doing is, is using a, um, a stepper motor type driven ejector to vary the, um, the nozzle size inside the ejector. So we'll take a closer look at this. Here's our mode of flow. So this would be your flow, high pressure flow from the gas cooler. And this is uh, also referred to as the mode of flow in ejector technology or terminology rather, the mode of, mode of flow enters the ejector here. And then what happens is we reduce the cross-sectional area in this uh, nozzle section. And what we're doing is exchanging uh, energies within the refrigerant. So what's happening is the pressure drops and the speed increases quite a bit, in fact. We're really gonna speed this refrigerant up. And when that happens, it creates a low pressure. So we're, we're converting from a high pressure, low speed to a low pressure, high speed. And when that happens, it opens up the opportunity to have a side flow here. So we'll call this, this is labeled suction flow. So now the ejector can actually take in a flow and a side port. And what it looks like is, is this. So here's our gas cooler. Pressure is quite high. The pressure is going to drop, okay? But the flow velocity goes from being somewhat of a low value uh, to a higher value. Okay, and then we can see where we induce the suction flow here. And in the mixing section, as the name implies, the mode of flow will then mix with the suction flow. And the mixing section is generally built in an ejector to be of a certain length in order to allow um, the, uh, the two flows to reconverge and uh, for the, the speed of the refrigerant and, and pressure to adjust. And in ejectors, there may be a shockwave or not. If the speed of the refrigerant ends up increasing above the speed of sound, then there will be a shockwave at some point in time in the mixing section where the pressure will just increase uh, very quickly and uh, then continue to increase as it's mixing with refrigerant and heading towards the, or mixing with the low the suction flow and heading towards the, uh, the diffuser. So you can see at the point where the shock wave is, the pressure increases again, and the velocity decreases. But this may or may not happen. Um, so you could just see a gradual increase uh, in pressure and a gradual decrease in velocity as the two flows converge. And then the diffuser, this is, um, you can see the, the shape of a diffuser here. It's a, a conical type shape. And as the CO2 passes through here, the pressure will increase. So here's a, a look at a um, one application for an ejector where we have the ejector that is taking the high pressure refrigerant from the gas cooler 
and its outlet is connected to the receiver. Then we have an evaporator that's connected to uh, the ejector at the suction port. And we have liquid that leaves the receiver and enters the evaporator. And what leaves the evaporator ends up back in the ejector. So this would be called a low lift type scenario. So it's a low lift ejector where it takes all of the flow um, from the evaporator, but doesn't actually have to lift it up uh, that much compared to uh, other applications. And, and note that the ejector, because it's not a compressor, um, an ejector doesn't need oil to operate. Um, we can have vapor or liquid enter the ejector and it's just heading back to the receiver anyways. And then leaving the receiver, uh, it would enter the compressor. And of course, this is a simplified drawing. Um, you know, other heat exchangers and that, um, of course, would likely need to be added here to protect the compressor uh, and that sort of thing. But this is just to give you an overview as to, as to how this works. And on to the right here, you can see the actual cycle that takes place. You can see where the pressure drops. This is from the uh, evaporator. Okay, and then the pressure has to drop, of course, as it enters the, the uh, ejector and mixes with the motor flow here. And here's where you can see the pressure increases again, back up to the receiver pressure and to the uh, compressor suction. So that's one application for an ejector and the processes are listed down here. There are some terms associated with uh, ejectors. One is, uh, these are all related to the performance of an ejector. So there's the pressure ratio, uh, which is the, um, the differential pressure um, of the ejector. So outlet, uh, um, your, your outlet minus the suction and then divided by the suction pressure is your pressure ratio. Then you have a pressure lift, which is the, um, the difference between your suction pressure in to the ejector and the pressure at the outlet of the ejector. Then you have the mass entrainment ratio, and the mass entrainment ratio is another uh, factor that determines the overall efficiency of an ejector. And this is a sample diagram, and I apologize, I don't have an updated version of this one yet. We are working on it. Uh, this is an earlier version of the, of the chart. Uh, the ejectors have actually become more and more efficient, but you can see how they work. Um, with a gas cooler pressure, um, here, actually, this should be in, in um, this should be in uh, in bar, I guess. Uh, here, so um, with a gas cooler pressure of say 85 bar, the um, mass entrainment ratio would be 18 percent. Um, and at a lower pressure, so we have less of a motive uh, force here. Um, the mass entrainment ratio is 10 percent. But again, note these should be in bar. I accidentally listed them in PSIA, so I'm sorry about that. So here's the overall formula showing the, um, um, the mass entrainment ratio multiplied by these differences here. Okay, so I mentioned before that expansion valves, high pressure valves reduce the pressure at constant enthalpy. But when you go through an ejector, it follows more of a constant entropy process, uh, allowing the net refrigeration effect to increase here. And, and what we're doing is actually taking the enthalpies here um, this would be uh, between the evaporator, the suction in, and the differential out, and then uh, dividing into that the, um, the enthalpy difference uh, between constant enthalpy process versus a constant entropy process. So I hope that makes at least a little bit of sense. This is meant to be just an introductory uh, to ejectors, but uh, hopefully that makes sense. So again, there's a low lift ejector. Um, it would look something like this. A low, low lift ejector is a higher entrainment. Um, as I had shown you, it entrains the entire mass flow. And uh, this would be in a single compressor stage type system. A high lift ejector would be something a little different where it could be applied um, into a parallel compressor stage, which is a pretty common way of using them. So we can see the ejector is, is here and the gas cooler outlet flow travels through the ejector, uh, passes into the receiver, but we have this side flow, which enables us to take refrigerant from the medium temp suction. So this is very interesting because 
If you recall, I said that parallel compression as it gets cooler out becomes very challenging depending on the number of stages that we have. Um, generally having one stage of parallel compression uh, it is not a great idea because your capacity turndown ratio is, is, is not all that great. Um, having more compressors to have a higher turndown uh, turn ratio is better, but we will reach a point where the parallel compressor, compressors need to be shut down and then our receiver um, pressure needs to be maintained using a flash gas bypass valve. So in this case, this is a way of loading up the parallel compressors um, and keeping them running because we're gonna take some load off the medium temp side and feed that into the ejector, uh, its side port and load up the parallel compressors. So the ejector is lifting the pressure from medium temp suction, which is lower than receiver pressure. Okay, to the uh, parallel compressor inlet. So you do get uh, a higher efficiency there. So there's different ways of applying these ejectors. Um, in the case of this um, high lift ejector, as it's called, um, it will only uh, be able to entrain some of the flow, of course, but some is better than none. And there will be an efficiency increase, of course, but it's a way of recapturing energy that's otherwise wasted just by passing it through a, a restrictive type device. Uh, such as an expansion valve, or in this case, a high pressure uh, high pressure valve in the high side of the system. And another way in which an ejector could be, uh, be used, and there's probably more than what I'm showing you here, but uh, uh, another possibility would be to use it um, as part of a defosta cycle. So here we have uh, a flash gas bypass valve that's closed, and we have vapor comes off the receiver, and enters a, um, a heat exchanger, which takes heat from the discharge of the medium tap compressors, transfers it to the flash gas. Again, like I said, flash gas is very normal to have uh, uh, liquid droplets in it, in addition to it being only at a saturated state. Okay, so it'll heat that up and then we can send that out uh, to the evaporators. Um, and then returning from the evaporators, we need to find a way to drive that back up into the receiver but we have to lift that pressure. So the, in this case, the ejector is being used to lift the pressure uh, from the defrosting pressure here in the evaporators up to the receiver. Um, so in order to do this, mode of flow becomes the, it's your gas cooler flow again. Okay, So the refrigerant leaving the gas cooler uh, at the outlet passes through the ejector valve, induces, uh, or the ejector valve here, induces the side flow which in this case will be the return from the defrosting circuits. And again, if there's liquid return, returning from the uh, evaporators, which is quite typical um, in a defrost system, uh, no problem, it's an ejector, uh, it's not going to damage it. You, you can return vapor liquid back into the ejector. So it's an interesting technology, it's a little more advanced in the control of the ejectors um, with high side pressure control would be um, perhaps even a little more challenging uh, because, you know, now you've got a couple other, several other variables. And one thing I, I didn't mention um, is there are other types of uh, uh, ejectors that are used on the market. Um, and uh, some of them are fixed step ejectors or fixed position ejectors, which are really optimum at one set of conditions. And then you have multiple ejectors in a, we'll call it a bank of ejectors. And in this case, you have a, a control control system that determines which ejectors need to operate at, at which conditions. And, you know, it could be any number of ejectors that uh, oftentimes they're different sizes or there may be a number of pairs of ejectors um, that operate this way. Another way to do it is with the proportional type uh, or variable ejector. And this is the, um, the type of ejector that, uh, that Bitzer uh, uses. This is um, um, an ejector that, that Bitsura has developed. Um, and you can find some information, uh, more information about the ejectors on the uh, Bitsura website at uh, bitsura.ca. So that's the end of the uh, presentation, Matt. Um, trench critical is, is, is quite a big topic, but I, I wanted to, to make sure I leave enough room for questions there, enough time. Thank you so much, Phil. That was a fantastic presentation. And uh, thanks for joining us for the third time. My pleasure. We do have one question from Trevor, and it might be one that you've answered towards the end there, but 
Do you know if there are many or any ejector systems in Canada? Um, uh, I believe there are. I'm, I'm told there are, yes. There are some ejectors out there. Um, in fact, the um, I was doing a seminar the other day and a, and a gentleman uh, was asking me about ejectors and he said that he does have an, a system that has an ejector um, defrost type cycle similar to the one I was showing you. So, um, and that's something, you know, that's that's quite new to me, Trevor. Um, and that's why I put the diagram up there. That's one uh, type of system that actually shows the use of ejector in a defrost type application. So it's something I'll be reviewing more too and, and looking deeper into. And I'm sure there's more other applications for these ejectors, but uh, uh, that was an interesting one to find out. Thank you so much. We've got about seven more minutes. Uh, while people, if you have any questions, please get them in now. But while we're kind of waiting on that, just a heads up to attendees that we have a we have a pretty loaded webinar schedule coming up May 9th. We've got the Green Energy Radiant Heating Solutions webinar. Uh, we've also got a greener Canada Greener Homes program an update from changes on changes from NRCAN and uh, Electrify Kelowna with Fortis BC coming up on May 19th. Uh, plus a bunch of others in June and July. So please, uh, if, you, if you enjoy webinars like this, we have a bunch more. You can go over to hrai.ca slash events, sign up and uh, enjoy. And you can also go to HRAI's YouTube page as well to catch the ones you missed. So Phil, I think um, I think you did such a good... Oh wait, no, we have one more question at the very last minute. Do you have low temperature compressors that can operate at high ambient conditions? Uh, low temperature compressors that can operate at high ambient conditions, we don't. So um, we don't have, you, you really need a two-stage process in order to, to achieve low temperature refrigeration um, when the ambient temperature is such that the system will have to operate super critical because the compression ratio uh, is just too high. So you really need a two-stage process, and that's why we apply subcritical type compressors on the low stage and, and uh, transcritical uh, compressors on the, the high stage or what we call the, the medium temp stage. And this is something that's been done for many years, even in HFC type systems and ammonia systems. In fact, they'll call the, the low stage is actually the booster compressor uh, because it boosts up the pressure um, to an intermediate pressure. And then you have your high stage, which will take the pressure further up into the transcritical range uh, due to the higher ambient temperature. So it does need to be broken down into stages. And, and if we if we try to do it with one compressor stage only, um, your discharge temperature will be so high, um, your, your efficiency will be quite low, but the, the discharge temperatures will be so high as they will create a problem with the lubrication system, overheating the oil, uh, carbonizing the oil, um, creating a lot of problems with the uh, compressor. Thanks, Will. I've got one more for you. Does Bitzer have any two-stage CO2 compressors coming to the market? Uh, this comes up from time to time, the discussion. Uh, at the moment, no, not that I'm aware of. I'm not aware of a, of a two-stage type. Uh, and this would be similar to the Bitzer two-stage compressor that we talked about on a, on a previous uh, HRAI webinar, where we covered the topic of uh, achieving low temperature with low temperatures with two stage compressors it would be something similar to that but we we do not have uh, something like that at the moment thank you and not a question but a comment great presentation phil thank you hrai from Trump. thank you very much and if there are any more questions uh, note that i have my email at the bottom of the screen here so feel free to send me an email if uh, uh if you wish great well, i hope this isn't the last time we see you phil it's always a pleasure and um thank you everyone for showing up to the webinar it was a good attendance today Thank you very much, Matt, and thanks very much, everyone, for attending. All right. Cheers. Have a good day.